Well, the Lauren gun running, of course, doesn't come out of nowhere. Uh, Ulster Unionists have been involved in gun running activities since at least the summer of 1911. Where things really change in terms of wanting to bring in a mass number of arms in one lift is to do really with two things that happen in December 1913 and January 1914. In December 1913, the British government passes a, a proclamation against the importation of arms into Ireland, which then makes it more difficult for guns to be brought in through what had been the normal routes of the, the earlier period. And of course firearms legislation had been very lax in this period anyway, so a lot of the early guns are simply purchased through uh, firearms dealers in Belfast with no great uh, legal problems thrown up there. So we have that, that issue about the proclamation coming in. Also the Ulster Volunteer Force had been formed from January 1913 and there was a sense by a number of the senior officers that men within it were becoming fairly restless, fairly bored with endless drills and didn't really see what the whole lot was meant to be leading to. So in January 1913, uh, sorry, January 1914, there are uh, meetings with um, the commanders of the Antrim regiments of the Ulster Volunteer Force with Edward Carson and James Craig and they say that they need guns if they're to maintain morale amongst their men. They say that they've got uh, 10,700 men enlisted but only 200 guns and that's not enough even for uh, training purposes let alone anything else. So really the genesis of the Lauren gun running goes back to those events of, of December 1913 and January 1914. In terms of it as an operation, it is a, a pretty impressive one. Uh, in total, something like 20,000 rifles and 2 million rounds of ammunition are landed at Larne, Bangor and Dongadee on the night of the 24th, 25th April 1914 with no interference from uh, the authorities. So this is a, a very impressive operation in those terms. The firearms are purchased in Hamburg and then smuggled on two ships. The first one is the steamship Fanny, which was a Norwegian registered vessel. And that then leaves Hamburg on, I think it's the 2nd of April, 1914. Now what's interesting there is that the British uh, Vice Consul in Hamburg warns the Foreign Office about the 12th of April that the Fanny is understood to be a British owned vessel and is being talked about as a gun runner. So it's quite interesting that while the ship's on the high seas, uh, the British government doesn't really do much about it. Were concerns, I suppose, about stopping shipping and particularly the idea of stopping neutral shipping, which of course had led to the problems for the, the Royal Navy in the past. Um, it had indeed fermented the war with the Americans in 1812. So uh, the, the Fanny isn't interfered with, manages to get close to the, the shore of, of uh, Ulster and then transships its cargo to uh, the Clyde Valley, which was a, a coal vessel that, that operated out of, of Ulster ports anyway, so it was thought would arise less uh, suspicion. So that part of the operation all works very well. Crawford manages to get uh, his uh, consignment of firearms to the, the Ulster coast. Uh, his own account, Guns for Ulster, makes this out to be a greatly heroic endeavour. Talks about you know, near mutiny by the crew, him having to threaten them with a revolver and so on. How much of that is true, we, we really don't know. Uh, when we look at the events of 24th, 25th April in the ports of Bangor, Dongadee, Larne, what's interesting there is how well the Ulster Volunteers were able to seal off these ports. Uh, local mobilisations take place and troops, police don't really do anything much to interfere. It's, it's particularly interesting in Bangor because there you had a British Army battalion up at Hollywood in Palace Barracks there, only about seven miles from Bangor, and they don't hear anything about what's going on. Uh, the UVF take over uh, the towns, cut off telephone communication over all the local police and coast guards and then make them sort of sealed off areas until the operation's over. But we should also say that there is a deception plan that takes place on the same night, which is a steamship that goes into Belfast uh, Harbour, which is met by uh, about 2,000 Ulster volunteers, and that ties up a lot of the customs and police in Belfast as they search it carefully looking for firearms, and it is just a dummy, there's nothing actually on board it.
But elements of the gun running don't work out as well as is sometimes thought. There's, whole, there's a whole range of problems to do with the transport. Uh, General William O'Dare, who's the UVF commander in Antrim and therefore essentially in command of things in Larne, he issues uh, UVF orders in the few days before the, the ship's expected, asking for all available transport to be sent to Larne Harbour, including uh, horses and carts. So we often get this idea that it's all brought away quickly by motor transport, but there's actually real problems in uh, getting the uh, guns unloaded and dispersing them. And actually an awful lot of the guns are actually kept close to Larne, close to Bangor, close to Dongadee for it seems you know, a week, 10 days after the gun running. So it's said that if the police had wanted to make a swoop, they could have, have done things there. Um, the other bits that, that don't work are that in Bangor the harbour facilities weren't properly secured so when the Clyde Valley comes in there they have to break out the local council fire uh, cart, essentially the sort of local fire brigade of the time, to uh, fill up the, the ship with more water um, so that it you know, could then raise steam to get to Donka Day. They haven't actually secured the, the pumps at Bangor Harbour. Um, so there are a few sort of minor hiccups in the whole thing and the real surprise is just the level of, of government inactivity. Uh, the, there's only one casualty in the whole event which is as impressive in its own way, uh, which is a Coast Guard, uh, a man called Painter, who uh, dies from a heart attack when he, he runs to get as, 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 commanding, as commander. Uh, to tell them of the events. So the Coast Guard are sort of overawed. The police that go down to the harbours are basically disarmed and told just stand there until this is all over. So it, it's, uh, I suppose, a success from the UVS point of view in terms of the staff work involved, in terms of the amount of equipment that's landed, and the fact that the, there's only really one fatality, um, and you know how directly linked that is to the events is unclear. Whereas, of course, the later Irish Volunteers gun running at Howth leads to um, uh, essentially a riot and the deaths of three people. So, an interesting context and comparison there.